Thank y'all so, so much for being here for this very first session on a Bible study on Luke. We're calling it Gut Level Compassion. Now, I think in the third session, we're going to talk about the Greek word that that subtitle comes from. But before then, I just want to tell you a story that I hope will kind of kind of give you a, a, an umbrella, a canopy, if you will, under which all of Luke's gospel hangs. Um, a couple of years ago, I was working with some girls who are in recovery. That's my favorite group of women to spend time with are women who are recovering from addiction. Um, not dissing y'all. I love being with y'all. But there's just something about a woman who has dealt with heavy addiction. Um, many of my friends in recovery have experienced prison as a result of felonies on their records. They just, they just don't have as many facades as I think the rest of us do. Those have dissipated in their quest to get free. And uh, most of my friends in recovery met Jesus behind bars. They got free while they were incarcerated. So anyway, they are the loveliest group of women to be with, and I love taking them to church. And we have these rules, and the rules are when they're in my car going to church, they can smoke because most of them have had a meth or crack addiction in their background. So usually cigarettes are kind of a stepping stone to them getting completely free. So I said, y'all smoke, but I can't stand the smell of cigarette smoke. So the windows have to be rolled down. And then the only other rule of when I take my friends to church is is I curate half of the music because I want to really get them to fall in love with worship music and to see that it's not kind of the boring you know, music of our past, but they'll actually love it. So half of what we listen to is, is worship music, more modern worship music. And then the other half, they get to choose as long as it doesn't have trashy lyrics or like misogynistic lyrics demeaning women. And so usually I pull into church, windows down in my car, smoke's billowing out the windows, and we're typically listening to the Commodores. We may have just been listening to something really wonderful and God-honoring, but usually by the time we pull in church parking lot, you know, it's all, she's a brick. So I know people at our church are like, who are these people coming to church this morning? Well, anyway, I was in exactly that posture not too long ago, and we all came in, sat on the second row. The girl to my left, she's, she's amazing. I mean, just amazing. I uh, was um, extremely addicted as a result of an abusive relationship. And the day she was planning to commit, commit suicide, there was a federal raid on her trailer. And she said, Lisa, I know those FBI agents in flak jackets were actually disguised, angels in disguise, because had they not come in and arrested me that very day, I, I, I was planning to kill myself. And I mean, just her face is radiant. You know, she's so in love with Jesus, still has the track marks on her arms. Well, anyway, she's sitting to my immediate left. Our pastor started talking about how the disciples were such a motley crew, how they did not have it all together. And, and she's listening. It had been a while since she'd been in a conventional church service. So I think she had forgotten kind of some of the protocol of church. She was just sitting there kind of sprawled next to me. And after he explained how rough these men were, her name was Lindsay, she elbowed me real hard in the ribs and she went, Miss Lisa, Jesus had a thing for losers, didn't he? <laughs> And I thought, that, that is better than any of my professors in seminary have framed it. And I think that's basically the principle of Luke. Over and over and over again in Luke's gospel account, you see that that's, that's kind of the theme. That's kind of the ringtone. Jesus has a thing for losers. More than the other gospel writers, Luke includes outliers. He includes outcasts. He includes the least of these, the, the unlovely. Those are the characters in his euangelion. That's the Greek word that means gospel. Now, before we dive into some of those characters, I want to give you a few other details about the gospel of Luke so you kind of see how it hangs different than the other three gospels. Luke was written about the same time that Matthew was written, uh, early 60s A.D. And by the way, A.D., sometimes we think it means after death. It means Anno Domini, the year of our Lord in Latin. And so it was written 30 or so years after the, the crucifixion and resurrection. Um, Mark was actually the first gospel 
I don't know why when they canonized scripture, they listed Matthew first. Mark was actually the very first literary compilation of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So, so Matthew and Luke borrow quite a bit from Mark's material, and that's why those three gospels are called the synoptic gospels. That's a fancy seminary word. All it means is they're similar in their literary format. John, the Gospel of John, is written about 25 years later, and his gospel is very different in the literary format. He does not include parables. He does not have a birth narrative. So, so his gospel kind of stands alone as the Joannine gospel. Now where Luke is, is different from, from Mark and from Matthew is Luke is a Gentile. As a matter of fact, he's the only known Gentile author of, of a book in the Bible. We've got a couple of books that are formally classified as anonymous. We aren't sure exactly who wrote them. A couple of Psalms are formally classified as anonymous. But the only books we know definitively were written by a non-Jew. That means he would be considered an outsider in his culture. Were written by Luke. He wrote the Gospel according to Luke. He also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Now, when they made Scripture a collated book that included 66 books, they inserted the Gospel of John between Luke and Acts. But most scholars now will tell you those two should be together because he probably wrote those as a seamless document. So if any of y'all are, are those women who read through the Bible in a year, First of all, my hat's off to you. I usually burn, off, burn out around Leviticus. But if you make it to the New Testament and you get to the end of Luke, vault over John. Come back for John later. Go straight from the end of Luke to the beginning of Acts. And you'll see this just symmetry of compassion. We're actually going to do that in the, the eighth session in this Bible study. But right now, I want to read y'all something that may clarify that a bit more from one of my favorite scholars when it comes to the Gospels. Also, one of my favorite professors, Dr. Craig Blomberg. I've been reading Dr. Blomberg's works for 30 years. He is the reason I chose to go to Denver Seminary. Um, for my doctorate because it was the last time he was teaching. He's now retired. Anyway, Dr. Blomberg writes this about the Luke-Acts connection. At first glance, Luke seems to be the hardest gospel to outline. A survey of commentators certainly reveals the least amount of agreement compared with treatments of Matthew, Mark, and John. Yet at the same time, we must always keep in mind when studying Luke that he wrote a sequel to his gospel, the book of Acts. In other words, Luke and Acts are kind of like Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back. I don't know if y'all saw the movie Star Wars when it came out. Some of y'all might not be as old as I am. But, but I love the first Star Wars. But then when I saw The Empire Strikes Back, all of a sudden I had more context. That's Luke and Acts. As you study Luke, you've got to recognize, oh, this is kind of the first book. There's a, there's a second book, a, a sequel if you will, to Luke. Now, in light of that context, I want to dive into what we've already established as the theme that Jesus has a thing for losers. And I want to talk about some of the outliers. That would be a more appropriate word, the outliers and, and the outcasts that he had a thing for. First would be the Samaritans. Now, you hear Samaritans in some of the other gospel accounts. Uh, John, talked about the Samaritan woman at the well. He made her um, a recipient of grace. Luke makes them heroes. And to understand how radical that was, you've got to understand the huge rift between Samaritans and Jews. It goes all the way back to the 10th century BC. Y'all remember the third king of Israel? Anybody remember him? Solomon? Scored great on his SAT, not so great with women. He was a player, <laughs> total player, had hundreds of pagan wives, and his wives were always jockeying for position for who was his favorite, who got the majority of his wallet. And so all of those children of all of those wives who were jealous of each other did not get along very well. And Solomon totally bungled passing the baton to an heir apparent. His son Rehoboam ended up being the fourth king of Israel. He was such a bonehead that just a few years into his leadership, Israel went from being one nation united under God, a theocracy. It ended up splitting into a northern kingdom 
and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom retained the name. I mean, they got the name Judah, but they retained Jerusalem, the, the crown jewel. Well, about 200 years after they split, a warring people group called the Assyrians came into northern Israel, completely eviscerated northern Israel, killed most of the men over the age of 12, took the rest of the people to Assyria as slaves, and left behind just a smattering of Jews. Well, the smattering of Jews who were left behind in northern Israel, most of them married Assyrians or other Gentiles. Well, those, those children, the offspring of a half-Jewish mama and a Gentile or Syrian father, those became known as Samaritans. To a Jew, they were half-breeds. Horribly punitive term, but that's exactly how they saw them. And the Samaritans didn't do a great job with regards to getting back into the Jewish good graces because when the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity, the southern Jews, and began to try to rebuild the temple and the wall around Jerusalem, as a matter of fact, that's where you first read about the Samaritans is in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, the Samaritans tried to sabotage that rebuilding process. Then the Samaritans went on to go, we're going to build our own temple on Mount Gerizim. You may remember the, the woman at the well talks to Jesus about, but our temple is on Mount Gerizim. They declared that the Jewish priesthood, you remember what high regard Jews held their priesthood in, the Samaritans said, nope, Jewish priesthood is illegitimate. We're going to start our own. Then they went on to say, we also don't like the Jewish scriptures. We're just going to cut and paste and use the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, and we're not going to listen to the rest of it. So you can imagine for a Jew to, to see these Samaritans take everything they held sacred and throw it under the bus, they're, they're just, there's resentment begin to grow. By the time you get to the first century, to the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, there is such a huge rift between Jews and Samaritans that Jews would publicly curse Samaritans when they went to temple. And that rift makes the fact that Luke makes a Samaritan the hero, not just a recipient of grace, but a hero in one of his parables. That is just absolutely radical. Instead of saying, let's have mercy on an outcast, he's like, let's actually elevate the outcast to the role of hero. It's shocking if you get the context of what was going on historically. The second group of outcasts and outliers, we could loosely call losers, that, that Luke spent a lot of time talking about are tax collectors and sinners. Now, a lot of people in the first century would have, would have said those two were synonymous because most Jews hated tax collectors. Do you all remember why? They were extortionists. A Jewish tax collector was basically in cahoots with Rome. And so Rome would levy a tax. The Jewish tax collector, remember Matthew was one of these before he became an evangelist. They would pad that tax, give what was due to Rome to Rome, and then keep the rest for themselves. So you had Jewish tax collectors who were driving beamers and had beach houses, and they had accumulated that wealth by exploiting their neighbors by stealing from their neighbors. So, so the other writers talk about tax collectors and sinners. Luke, of course, is the only one who makes a tax collector a hero. Turn to Luke chapter 18. And Bridget, would you read that short story about a tax collector? Sometimes they're called publicans because they exact tax from the public for the Roman government. Bridget, read that short story about a, a Pharisee and a publican in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Mm -hmm. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Mm. She's got a, a Pharisee, a religious leader. We could loosely call him a deacon if he was in modern context. So, you know, he goes to church all the time. He's got his Torah highlighted with all kinds of different colors. He looks the part, you know, definitely seems to, to put religion on a, a, a high view. And yet Luke tells a story that says, no, he's actually the loser and the tax collector, who's a flagrant sinner, he's actually the one with a softer heart. He's the one who's going to recognize his need for mercy. I love that Luke takes the people that we would kind of kick to the religious curb, and he says they're actually the ones who are cognizant of the fact that they need a relationship with me. The other marginalized people group that Luke writes about more than any of the other gospel writers are women. I know it's odd to think of a woman as an outlier or, or even a loser in, in our culture, but in the first culture, you've got to remember, women are second-class citizens. Uh, one of the common rabbinical proverbs in the first century was better that the Torah, the Jewish scriptures, better that Torah be burned than read by a woman. Women were not allowed to give uh, witness in a public trial because we were considered too emotional. Women were largely regarded as chattel, as something a man could own. There's a few exceptions like Deborah in the Old Testament, who was essentially the prime minister of Israel for a while. But by and large, women were mistreated in, in Jewish culture. And Luke not only talks about them a lot, he doesn't cast them in a punitive light or even in a weak light. Turn to Luke chapter 8. I love this story. Luke chapter 8, soon afterwards, he, Dr. Luke's talking about Jesus here, Jesus went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, that's the disciples, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. So these are not weak women. These aren't women who are you know, cross-stitching in some black bag back room and praying for the disciples who have the hard jobs. They're not making casseroles. These women are lit, y'all. You've got Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Chusa is Herod's household manager. Remember, this is Herod Jr. Remember who Herod Sr. was, Herod the Great? He's the megalomaniac who tried to have Jesus killed. He was a narcissist, named all his sons Herod. This is one of his sons. He hates Jesus too. Interestingly enough, Joanna, who was in Jesus' crew, is married to Chusa, his right-hand man. Don't you know that was some interesting pillow talk? Where's Herod going to be tomorrow? What's his itinerary? Where is, where is he going? Have you ever wondered why Jesus was able to slip away from the Roman soldiers when they came in to try to apprehend him? Do you wonder if it wasn't Joanna going, oh, I wouldn't go to that coffee shop today because Herod and his cronies are going to be there. She wasn't a weak-willed woman. She didn't have some subjugated position or job. She was the head of Jesus' security details. She was in counterterrorism. I, mean, I love that. Susanna, it says, provided for Jesus out of her own means, so she underwrote his ministry. Doesn't sound like a weak woman begging for scraps, does it? And then you've got Mary from Magdala. We always call her Mary Magdalene, but Magdalene is not her last name. That's where she's from. Magdala means fish tower. She was from this two-bit city on the Sea of Galilee. There was a tower there. They called it Fish Tower. And it says before she met Jesus, she had seven demons. What, was the, what does the number seven represent in biblical literature, y'all? Completion. And so most scholars think what Luke was trying to tell us there in Luke 8 is Mary from Magdala was completely oppressed. If you were a Jewish mama with a son in high school, you're not going to let your son ask Mary from Magdala to prom. She was an outcast, an outlier, marginalized. Jesus engages with her. He heals her. And then God chooses her, our sovereign God, who, who is so specific about details. 
He put stripes on zebras. He gave my baby the perfect amount of melanin in her skin. Such a specific God when he thought, who am I going to choose to be the very first witness to the risen Christ? Should I choose somebody with a degree, somebody with a platform, somebody with a ton of followers on Twitter? Nope. I'll choose Mary from Magdala, arguably the most marginalized woman from her town. I'll choose her for what's the most important job in in human history, certainly biblical history. I love that Luke elevates women. He's really the only gospel author who does. And then the, the last outlying group that we'll talk about are the poor. The other gospel writers talked about the poor, but usually they were talking about the poor in spirit. It's what Matthew's talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is actually talking about the literal poor. The, those people who can't afford to shop even on the end caps at Target. Those people who get food stamps. Jesus, uh, Luke not only talks about the poor, once again, he elevates the poor. Melinda, would you real quickly read Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 24? Parable of the, man, of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried. And he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. It would be highly unlikely in the first century to have any kind of regard or respect for a man of no material means, especially if he had open sores, because open sores made him ceremonially unclean according to Mosaic law. And so someone might sling a little mercy his way, hurl a coin at him from time to time, but not elevate him to the position of authority. And yet that's exactly what Luke does. Luke takes the the wealthy man who was selfish and had no mercy, and he denigrates him to the point of, of begging the beggar for help. Luke turns conventional understanding, especially in their culture, on its head. You can see why that ringtone, Jesus had a thing for losers, didn't he, really permeates the entire gospel of Luke. I was having coffee with a friend recently. We had been to the same seminary class, and we were talking about how much we love that class. And this girl's much sweeter than I am, has a much stronger Southern accent. And about 10 minutes into our conversation, she leaned back and sighed, and she went, Don't you think the gospel is like the Cinderella story, Lisa? And I was like, No. No, I don't. But I didn't want to be impolite, so I didn't say no. I just kind of remember what I said, just kind of, hmm, hmm. But the whole way home from, from that coffee, I was thinking, why did it bug me that she compared the Cinderella story to the gospel? And about the time I pulled in my garage, I realized why it bugged me. Jesus didn't choose Cinderella. Because if you're familiar with the story or you watch the movie, Cinderella deserved the prince, right? She was a hard worker. She helped the mice. She's beautiful. The glass slipper fit. I mean, when she gets paired with the prince, everything in us goes, ah, that was supposed to happen, right? She deserved to be queen. That's not the gospel. In the gospel, the ugly stepsister stands on the edge of the dance floor, the one with frizzy hair and a huge hairy mole, And she's wearing a horizontally striped dress and there's muffin top from her Spanx. Hasn't had a pedicure in a long time. Everybody's avoiding her. And the handsome prince walks into the room and sees her and he makes a beeline for her. And people gasp when the prince asks the ugly stepsister to dance. But when she moves 
into his embrace on the dance floor, she becomes beautiful. Y'all, that's the gospel. It's certainly Luke's gospel. It's where outliers and outcasts and the least of these and those others would call unlovely become the beloved bride of Christ. Let's sit in that for just a second. Jesus, 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 thank you for this love letter called the Bible and thank you for this particular gospel of Dr. Luke. Thank you for that theme that we don't have to have it all together to capture your heart. Lord, we pray as we embark on this, this, um, this journey, seven more weeks of, of exploring Luke's gospel account, we pray you would give us uh, bigger eyes and bigger ears and softer hearts so that we would see more clearly and, and hear louder and understand more fully who you are as our perfectly gracious Redeemer and who you've called us to be as your messy, mistake-prone, unconditionally loved daughters. We love you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name, the name that one day every knee will bow before. And all of God's girls in Nashville, Tennessee said, amen. amen.